Welcome back to Monroe Live, everybody. Back by popular demand, we have Carl and Sue, um, who did a great job of covering the IP top cover in an episode that was recently released. But we have so much content here. We have cross car beams today on this table. And I want to take a second to do a quick shout out to Sabic. Uh, they helped us immensely for the support of our road trip uh, for the Monolith Plaid. So we want to give them a quick shout out. Um, so Carl and Sue, take it away. I'll be back for an outro. Sandy is out on uh, vacation today, so I'm here in, in his stead. So there well, you thank go. you. All right, thank you. So we're looking at the different types of cross car beams. And honestly, of course, there is only one in the Tesla Model S, but we wanted to try and show a slight evolution. Now, traditionally, as uh, automaker is going to get started, one of their first cross car beams is going to be a stamp welded steel cross car beam. And unfortunately, we do not have one of those here anymore. The stamped steel cross car beams, it's very labor intensive and you can have a lot of problems with fixturing because every single stamped bracket that would be considered part of this cross car beam has to be individually welded, fixtured in place. That can cause a lot of problems. It can cause build issues. It can cause a lot of weight, excess material. Um, have you had to work around those I've metal stamped? Worked around them a lot. Uh, matter of fact, with reference to that tolerance issue, there's something on a cross car beam in the standard steel welded construction called a jack bolt, which is you put the cross car beam in, line it up to the critical side, and then you use this jack bolt to adjust because you have so much tolerance stack up to adjust to attach to the other side of the vehicle. And obviously this is not ideal because a large part of the, the purpose of a cross car beam is to add structure that enables the safe enclosure of the occupants, the, especially in the event of a T-bone <laughs> impact. About a quarter of all fatalities in auto accidents are, are from a T-bone side impact. And this cross car beam rigidifies the car between the A pillars so that when the car is hit, those loads are transferred across the car and the occupant space isn't crushed. Um, also, what a cross car beam does is prevents the firewall from intruding up into your space and it holds the steering column where it belongs. Again, in a crash, this is really critical because you need to be able to steer to avoid secondary impacts. You need to have that steering wheel not come at you. And, and so that rigidity is really critical. Um, keeping the firewall in place is really critical. And again, just with respect to the safety, the cross car beam holds your airbags. The, the holes that you see are where the airbags tuck into this. So the steering column comes through here, but that hole over there, not, or actually yep. up here, not only that mounts to glove box area, but not only uh, holds up a lot of your dash and trim components, it holds your passenger airbag so that when that deploys, it comes and, and protects you. And again, we don't have a stamped cross car beam, but think about all those metal stampings. Each one is going to be blanked, it's going to be punched, stamped into shape, mm -hmm. but now you have all of these raw sharp edges, so sometimes mm -hmm. they have to be coined. There's a lot of processing on that beam. So a lot then, of welding, yeah. a lot of welding. Then they went to a style like this. This is a cast magnesium beam, and when this came out, it seemed like this was going to be the next wonderful and best thing. Uh, magnesium is incredibly light, but it's also incredibly strong for its weight. Now with that stamped steel cross car beam, anywhere where you wanted an attachment, you had to throw up an arm, throw up a tab, have another weldment. This you could include a lot of those features all into one. So everyone was switching over to mm -hmm. some sort of a cast mag beam and they're very, very beneficial for when this was really, really needed. However, I think they kind of did a bad job on this one. And this is the reason why. You have the opportunity to cast in all of your attachments. This vehicle also has a carrier. This carrier has nothing to do with a surface. This is all providing attachment points for trim. So it seems like kind of a waste that there is still a top pad on here, but then you have this carrier that is just providing attachments Going back to a cross car beam that is providing attachments, this is a very expensive part that it would have been nice to be able to have gotten rid of. And in addition to that part, there's even more structure that is in the top pad that, that the trim is wrapped around. Yep. 
So that's an intermediate part that probably doesn't need to be there, adds a lot of weight. And you saw that there were fastener attachments both in that and in this that look identical. Integrate. So then we went over to the Tesla Model Y. And the Tesla Model Y has this extruded aluminum tube over molded with nylon. This has a nice amount of weight savings, but then the other thing is you have a lot of benefits from the injection molding that are even above and beyond the cast part. You can get a lot more complex features, uh, move your attachments to where you need them, and you're getting that solid um, structure from that aluminum tube. And this aluminum tube is an extrusion that's then placed into a hydroform situation. Uh, hydroform is where you put the tube into a, a mold with a certain shape, you pressurize it inside with water. In this case, uh, 600 bar pressure is the water pressure in this. You blast the tube out to the shape of the mold with that water pressure. And then in the case of this beam, this is an L-ring clinger design. And what they do is they then in that same mold shoot uh, 300 degrees Celsius plastic, which then cools and forms around that hydroform tube. So it's all done in one process, which makes it very efficient. So if you look here, you can see how that plastic has bled out. As they were injection molding these um, structure pieces, you have leaks where this plastic is coming out. But since this is a solid tube, basically we're only relying on that plastic from being able to actually stick, which as you can see here, it didn't. So there are some drawbacks from this solid tube, which was done on the Tesla Model Y, which brings us over to the Model S. This is not an aluminum tube. It went back to steel. Why would we go backwards? Why would we go from stamped steel to this cast magnesium to aluminum getting lighter, lighter weight, going to steel again? Are we increasing weight? And the actual answer is no, this is lighter than the aluminum one from before. If you look at that issue that we were talking about, how we were relying on this plastic sticking to the metal, there are through holes in this metal bracket. That plastic actually flows through those through holes into ribbing in the plastic on the B side. So it's actually securing all of this structure to that steel cross car beam a lot better than what we were getting here on the aluminum. And these ribs are also reinforcing your box section, which is now a three-sided channel, whereas here you had a full box section, as it were, with, with the full round tube. But now you're using your lighter weight plastic to reinforce this. And this is a, a glass-filled plastic, which gives it extra rigidity. Um, something else here with steel that you can do is you can choose the size of your section. When you start with an aluminum extrusion, that extrusion, you're going to have the same amount of aluminum across the entire length. Whereas here, when you start with a steel, a steel blank, you can choose where you're putting a, a taller cross section versus a shorter cross section so that you can optimize your mass across the width of the beam. Now, you said this is a glass filled part. It is a filled part. This one right here is a 60% glass filled nylon. This is nylon. I do not know what this is filled with. The color and texture looks different between the two, but that's not really saying much. Different molding methods could have affected that. However, there is one thing that I suspect, I know, which we will talk about later, on the center console in their structure, they're using an injection molded carbon fiber. So it's a nylon plastic with carbon fiber reinforcement rather than glass reinforcement. I don't know if that is what this is. Entirely I went through possible. and I burned some samples for comparison. So on our top pad, this is a fiberglass reinforced polypropylene. I burned it right here to expose the fiberglass. Um, very, very rough. I hate exposing fiberglass. I went ahead on this cross car beam and I also burned a section trying to understand exactly what this was. If I can remember where I burned this at, it was a much smoother, softer finish than the fiberglass um, reinforced part. I don't know. I don't want to say, oh, here it was. 
I don't want to say one way or the other. I, I'm, I'm not going to say, yes, they did this amazing thing. They made a, f a carbon fiber reinforced nylon on their cross carbine. I would be lying to say that confidently. However, I can say maybe because we do know that they are using it in other locations. So in Monroe, when we tear all of this stuff down, we build a report. Those reports can be thousands of pages long and are normally thousands of pages long. They'll do a complete vehicle report, but then we will also dive into the individual subsystems. Uh, you can purchase these reports. You can purchase reports that are just certain commodities. You only want to know about the battery. You only want to know about the interior. You only want to know about seating. Um, they'll even customize reports. If you say, there's this one thing that I'm interested in, you can contact them. They save all of the parts here so that they can go back and reference and build a report to your specifications, what you want to see, what you want to know. I just wanted to make mention of that to uh, let everyone know what is possible. I know a lot of you were able to purchase, what was the, uh, the BMW report that was yeah, sold at a big BMW discount. BMW i3 that you can still purchase and download for $10. It's over 20,000 pages of information. Um, relating to the cost and manufacturing of the entire BMW i3. Um, that's sold as a representative report right now simply because uh, that was a 2014 and people are more interested in, of course, what's current because as you can see, when we went from a stamped steel assembly of parts to a cast to an aluminum hydroform to a stamped with a novel material, this changes very quickly in the automotive industry and so you wanna stay current. So in using a cross carbine, all right, if I'm on the assembly line, what am I going to do? You will have a JIT supplier or an integrator that is going to have these parts provided to them or they will source them themselves. This cross carbine will go into a fixture and it will be held in the same points where this would be held in vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, then the operators will start bringing all of the components together. So this top pad, which we saw yesterday is a subsystem. This would have been built up to this stage in advance prior to being brought to the cross car beam. I don't have a fixture here to show this, but if we were to pick this up and fit it in an alignment, there are locators. Center first. There we go. Centered and located. All right. So this cross car beam is now located to the top pad. Of course, it would have been done the other direction in the assembly plant. You will have locator features, which there are a few of them across this IP. Those locators will hold it in place so that you can then drive in any screws, bolts, or fittings that would be installed. You'll have your top pad, you'll have the entire HVAC, then we'll have the outer trim components will build up across this entire stack. Mm -hmm. This will be a completely assembled IP with all of those components ready to install in a vehicle. When no. you get to the vehicle installation, what you're gonna discover is that this thing has now gotten really heavy because you're hanging, as I mentioned earlier, your airbag is in your top pad assembly here. Your airbag is part of this. All of your ducting, your HVAC, your screen faces, everything that, that mounts onto this is going to be attached to it. So it's very heavy. So when it comes to the line, it is installed through the side via an ergo arm, an ergonomic arm. And that arm will be bearing the weight of this whole assembly. And then an operator simply helps to guide it into position in the vehicle, again, using locators. And those so locators are very substantial. These are, come take a look close at these. These are ideal locators. They're very strong, they're very sturdy, and they come with this point so that you get close to that circle where this is gonna drop in and this will really help guide and seat your IP into the vehicle. It's very dangerous um, in those assembly lines of damaging your vehicle while it's going down the line. We don't want that ergo arm, we don't want this IP banging up on the doors, banging up on the dash, damaging components of this, scratching your paint. So a very, very easy and convenient way of locating and fixturing is important. And then once that's in place, the bolts for the cross car beam, the location bolts into vehicle will then all be secured. 
And then another issue in the older vehicles was where you had the tunnel, you had to get, you, you want this cross car beam to touch not only against the sides, the A pillars of the vehicle and attach to the front of the vehicle, to the dash. You also want it to touch down onto the floor so that you have vertical rigidity and structural attachment. And so in a lot of the older vehicles with the tunnel, it was an issue because this is such a large part where you had to bring it in, lift it over the tunnel and seat it. And some manufacturers dealt with this in some ways and others dealt with it in others where they have this be a separate piece, add it afterwards, um, you know, multiple pieces coming up from the floor. But now with electric vehicles where it's a flat skateboard, you don't have that concern anymore. Otherwise though, this cross car beam is essentially the same whether you're in a BEV, uh, in an electric vehicle or in an internal combustion engine vehicle. And that's the thing is it can be the same. Everything that Tesla has done here, trying to create a lightweight cross car beam can be done in any other vehicle. Absolutely. And look, Corey's back. It's time to wrap up. It is. <laughs> Thank you for coming back. Well, I don't really need to wrap this thing up. You guys do a phenomenal job. Thank you, Sue and Carl, for running through this for everybody who watches Monroe Live. Once again, thanks for all those subscribers. We're approaching 300,000. Um, we're at like 280 something. Um, it really, this allows our engineers to give their time to, to go through all this detail for you because it is a, it's a really a great thing for us, the, Mon the Monroe Live YouTube channel. So thanks for watching, have a great day.